morning, brethren. I wanted to begin with the testimony from the prophet Isaiah. It's a true testimony, one to be seen and believed by us as well, because what it's doing with the ministry of the prophet is, is to help formulate our knowing God, to shape our thinking about the God of heaven. Isaiah 6.1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. See, from these earliest revelations that God has given to his prophets, he is showing the trueness of who he is. He is the Lord, and he is high and lifted up. He is in the true position of majesty and glory and might and power. And it's his train that filled the temple. See, God is the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. God is the preeminent one in heaven. Everyone and everything else can be at best secondary. The the testimony of the prophet Ezekiel would affirm this truth as well concerning God and of his highness. Ezekiel 1.1, now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Kibar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. See, when God opens the heavens, the first thing he reveals is himself. He reveals that he is the preeminent one, the high one to be seen by men, to be known by men. See, your salvation depends on you knowing the only true God. See, God is the supremely, the supreme one that is being revealed and shown, even in these early days of the revelation that he was given to his prophets. And by those prophets, God is revealed to be far above all, be they in heaven, be they in earth, or be they under the earth, be they seen or unseen, God is above them all. And when the apostle John, he beheld a door opened in heaven, and he was beckoned to come up hither, and he saw a throne was set in heaven, and one that sat upon the throne. See, this was the same one that Isaiah was given to see. This was the same one that Ezekiel was given to see, that God himself is still on the throne and still being the main focus of the revelation. And as such, God had the apostles' full attention. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in the sight like an emerald. See, God was revealing his true highness and his glory and his majesty, his might and his power. See, at the very heart of the gospel, at its very core, at its very foundation, is God himself. Through the gospel of God, the very person of God is being revealed in all his glory, in all his majesty, in all his power, in all his might. In the gospel of God, see, the very divine character in nature is being made known. A nature and glory that shines forth. God's righteousness shines forth. In his holiness, it's demonstrated. That it is not only shown, it's demonstrated. And by what he says and by what he does. And there is never a contradiction between the two. For what he says... He does. And what he does, it's because he's said it. The Lord of hosts had sworn, saying, Surely, as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. See, it is God's purpose and his workings that are the emphasis of the gospel of God. And his ways that are revealed unto the fulfillment of of these things being accomplished according to his good pleasure. 
It's through the gospel of God that these things are made known. All others, be they the mighty seraphim, or the four and twenty elders, or the four living creatures, even men, are only brought into consideration of the gospel of God by virtue of their close proximity to God, or as they are brought by God into the working of his purpose. Apart from their closeness to God, or for their involvement in his eternal purpose, there really is no reason for any of them to be revealed or even considered, be they heavenly hosts or men. But see, there's something more that God wants to reveal in his highness and his glory, and that, pertain, and that pertains to men. See, he is the holy God, the only true God. He is high and lifted up. He is the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, and his name is holy. But he also desires to dwell among them that have a contrite and humble spirit. See, this is, this is the good news of this high and lofty God that he wants to, deter, to, to declare unto his people. See, God himself is the source of the gospel of God. The gospel of God. See, he is its author, and he is its finisher. He is its beginning. He is its end. See, God has declared these things that he begins works, but he also finishes them according to his purpose. Amen. See, the gospel of God is also about God. It's concerning him, with him, with whom we have to do. And this truth is just the beginning of the good news of the gospel of God. See, God is also the main declarer of that gospel. He is the main revelator. This word that is spoken, thus saith the Lord, or the Lord or God said, or the Lord or God spake, are recorded some 900 times in the, in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't account for the very specific times that you know it's God that's saying this, but it just doesn't say the Lord said it. See, the gospel of God reveals that God is a speaking God. Yes. He speaks, and it happens. Idols are not such. Men make idols of their own de design, but these idols, they cannot speak. God is a speaking God. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past under the fathers by the prophets. God spake unto them. And the things that God spake unto them were in seed form. See, these were, these were things that God revealed to them, but they were not determined by God to remain that way. God had determined for them to be opened up in the fullness of the, of the glory of God to be revealed, but this would require a superior spokesman. See, this would require one from heaven, one who knew God. See, who went, one who's with God from the beginning and is God. See, this would require this one to make known God. Amen. But, see, this, 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 what, what God had desired to reveal of himself, she required this superior spokesman, and God provided him. The Lord Jesus Christ, that's who we're speaking about here concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, the superior spokesman that God has provided. Amen. And Jesus would announce this in the days of his flesh. John 7, 37, in that last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This, this not only required, this work not only required a superior spokesman, but it required an exalted spokesman. Yea, and even a glorified spokesman in order to reveal these things of God. Verse 39 affirms this to be the case. 
But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Oh, but when Jesus was glorified, when he was glorified, those rivers began to flow out and the glory of God was being revealed. Amen. The Apostle Paul was such a one, was such a vessel that God had chosen to reveal him. We have heard, see, that God is a God that works by means. And the means that God has determined for this word to come forth would be through men, through his chosen men. See? That they would be co-laborers together with God in this work. God had determined this. The Apostle Paul was such a one. He said he was separated unto the gospel of God. God separated him unto the gospel of God. God chose him to preach the gospel of God. And that should be no surprise unto us that God chooses his people to do this work. The re we have the record. Abraham was chosen of God out of Ur of the Chaldees. Noah was chosen as the one that would come through the flood. See, David was a man after God's own heart, chosen of God to be king. This is God chooses these ones to do his work. The apostle was such a one. And he was faithful in that ministry. He declared and he opened up this gospel of God. Now these things, again, were begun from the very beginning. Through his prophets, God was laying this foundation of who he is and what he does, what he hates and what he loves. Through his prophets, God began to reveal and teach men about himself. He is God Almighty, the Lord thy maker, that had stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. God formed all the creation by his eternal power and Godhead, both the seen and the unseen, and he established them all. The Lord is his name, and there is none else beside him, glorious in holiness, fearful in praise, doing wonders. Amen. See, God's a God that does wonders. This is what God is making known of himself. He's a God who does wonders. From the beginning, he is making known that he is a God doing wonders. Beginning with the creation of all things, God would begin to make himself known as he does wonders. He created the heavens and the earth, and he did it with a word. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And as the men reckoned upon this, and opened their understanding being opened up about God, they could say in truth that the, the creation of the world is the works of his hands, the works of his fingers. And in, his, in our eyes, these are glorious wonders. And it will be in the, in the creation, in the earth, that God will make this arena what he would be doing wonders. Wonders that only God could do. Wonders which God himself had purpose to do. Wonders which will cause even the angels of heaven to look into this. Since God created all things, the creation is in subjection to the God who created it. To do whatsoever he had said. Whatever he commanded. God is able to cause it to reign on that earth 40 days and 40 nights, breaking open all the fountains of the great deep and to open all the windows of heaven to destroy every living substance that he had made off the face of the earth because of their wickedness. See, God is able to cause this. And yet, yet in this most deadly calamity, God is able to keep Noah and the, and the seven other souls. In that great calamity, God's able to keep them. He's able to keep them alive, to bring it through them, that calamity, and keep them alive. 
See what he was, he's beginning to show things here now. This is, this is far more than a children's Bible story. This is a revelation of the only true God, of who he is and what he's able to do. But what relevance does this have, this, this account of Noah and the ark? Does it have any relevance for us now? Well, I want to tell you, you're gonna, you're, you want to know about you want to know about this God on that day of judgment. Amen. See, because on that day of judgment, there's going to be a separation between the sheep and the goat, between the godly and the ungodly, between the righteous and the wicked. Now, how are they all going to fare on this day? We know that the wicked are going to be cast into the lake of fire. But see, God has determined to make his people know this about himself, that the righteous will not be destroyed with the wicked. See, he, he began to reveal this about himself from the very beginning when he, when, he, when he saved Noah through the ark. God is showing that he is glorious in holiness, fearful in praise, doing wonders. Amen. The gospel of God also reveals there are more about God. He can choose a man which was about 100 years old, named Abram. His own body dead concerning the bringing forth of seed and give him to a wife whose womb dwelt deadness. And from them he would bring forth seed greater than the number of the stars of heaven. Amen. Wherefore thou art great, O Lord God, for there is none like thee, neither is there any God besides thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. This is the God we're talking about here. Amen. God can lead a, a people, a mere 70 in number at one time. He would lead them into a nation that would become unto them an iron furnace of affliction. And in the midst of that iron furnace, God would increase them and multiply them exponentially. That on a, on a day determined by God, even in the millions would come out. And he would bring them out in a single night. Without a single hoof being left behind. And not even a dog would move its tongue against them. Who had heard of such a thing? Who had seen such a thing? This is our God we're talking about here. And there's still more to be seen of his working. In this account that he gave of the bringing out of the children of Israel from Egypt, God would harden Pharaoh's heart against his people, causing him to go after them with evil intent. And when Pharaoh came upon them at the Red Sea, God parted the sea and made the sea dry land, and the people crossed it on dry ground. But when Pharaoh pursued them through the sea, God brought the waters upon them, and there remained not so much as a single one of them alive. See, in the sight of men, these acts of God are show, truly showing he's a God that does wonders. Wonders that only God himself could perform. And they would be correct. But what God was saying in heaven and in earth according to his working in mights, these are according to his working in mights. He's revealing this. But yet from God's perspective, these events occurred by the blast of his nostrils. As easily as man withdraw breath, so it was made known that this is how God performed this. These are the wonders that we're talking about. But see, they're, they're, they're showing something about God here. See, in these, in these early times, they're revealing something about God that men would trust him, believe in him, of these greater works, these greater wonders that he's going to do, greater works than even... He accomplished in the days of Moses and in the prophets. He was going to effect a work that would be everlasting. A work that he himself had purposed from before the foundations of the world. He would, he would work salvation in the midst of the earth. By, through, in, and because of Jesus Christ, his beloved son. These greater and mightier works being done by God would have, was, would have an effect upon men who believed it, opening up of the eyes to know 
that I, the Lord, have done these things. See, the, the working of God is not to just do them without not an understanding in his people that I, the Lord, have done this. And so he was sowing this truth about himself from the very beginning. The gospel of God reveals this higher working, an eternal and everlasting working of God. For God is my king of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. He is working salvation in the midst of the earth. Now the gospel of God reveals that the so great salvation that God has purposed in Christ Jesus is the epitome of God doing wonders. And his working in the earth is determined by God to be obtained by men. Therefore, it requires men to see and know it. So God will show it to you. And the main showing will be that of himself, that God himself is the rock of our salvation. And is, is to be blessed and exalted by all who partake of him. For in salvation, God has become our horn of salvation. He has become our shield. He has become our strong tower. And with all these and the more that God does in salvation, he clothes us with it. Even the garments of salvation and with a robe of righteousness. We, we conclude then by these things that God has shown unto us. We affirm that which was spoken by the psalmist, that salvation belongeth unto the Lord. And his glory is great in thy salvation. See, the main revealing of God and the things of God will be most clearly seen in his working salvation in the midst of the earth. Salvation is the epitome of God's doing wonders, yea, even revealing the deep things of God. But know this about God as well. Even though he desires to make these things known, these are not common things. They are very precious and of great worth. There is nothing in the earth so precious that can be compared and are even worthy that can be compared to the deep things of God. These are God's things. And he will determine who he will reveal them to and when he will do so. Amen. From the beginning, God would announce the secret things belong unto the Lord. From early times of man dwelling on the earth, God has made known that there are secret things, hidden things, because they are God's things. They belong to the Almighty God and the everlasting God. These secret things are God's and God's alone. God keeps them close. He keeps them hidden in himself, laid up in store with himself and sealed up among his treasures. These secret things are, are precious to God. They're likened unto a precious treasure, like the treasures of wisdom and the knowledge of God. These are precious treasures, for they are the very thoughts and intents of God's heart. They're exceeding great things, and they show forth the divine person and his holy and righteous character and justice of him. His desires and his eternal and everlasting purpose are, are shown in this as well. These secret things of God are not uncertain. They are sure and steadfast because God is sure and steadfast. For he is from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Amen. Now, while these secret things were kept hidden from men, they were not kept hidden from him waiting for them to be discovered by man. As if a man would be able to gather some sort of clues and hints and helps to enable him to find out the secret things of God. For how can one whose life is but a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away, uncover or discover that which God, who is from everlasting to everlasting, kept secret? The discovering or uncovering of these secret things of God falls into the category of, with men, this is impossible. The only way men would know of the secret things of God, God would have to reveal them to them. And this is precisely what the gospel is. 
God not only desires to make these things known, he is able to reveal them. He is able to make known his precious things to his people. And he has done it by, which, that, by that thing which he himself has ordained. Romans 16, 25 and 26 says, Now to him, God, who is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God. Now, the working of God's salvation is effectual. Again, these things were determined by God for men to see and to take hold of. And the gospel announces that it was God, the God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, he commanded the light to shine into your heart Amen. to give you the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God has determined these things to happen, and God is working them. See, this is the, the announcement. He's working this great salvation in the midst of the earth, and his people, see, are receiving it. They're obtaining these things that God has determined for them. God hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself. Ephesians 1, 8 and 9. Even that mystery which had been hidden from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. These are, these are the ones chosen by God that he would make this revelation known of himself, his saints. But this working of salvation is no simplistic work. This work that God is doing is not such. For this great wonder that God is doing, that men would know him, the only true God, unto eternal life, would require far more than God speaking of a word unto, unto creation, or to do it with the blast of his nostrils. It would take far more than that. This work would require one who was very intimate and close to God. One that you might say was in the bosom of the Father. One who was with God from the beginning and is God, who is able to lighten, lighteneth every man that cometh into the world. One who knows the Father in all his deepness of his eternal purpose, of his ways, and what it would require to satisfy his righteousness and holiness in the redemption of men to himself. One who is able to save, one who is able to deliver, one who is able to redeem, one who is able to help us in our time of need. One who is able to rule and to reign in righteousness and to intercede for us in the presence of the holy, holy, holy God. And the gospel of God declares that we have such a one. God's beloved son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And God began to testify of him from the very beginning. Through Moses, God testified of Jesus. And through the prophets, God testified of Jesus. And through the Psalms, God testified of Jesus. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. God himself being the chief proclaimer of his beloved son. The gospel of God reveals and makes known to us Jesus, his Christ, the one in whom his soul delights. And God's beloved son, see, this is, this is God making that revelation known of his son. He wants his people to know God delights in him. God delights in Jesus. Amen. From before the foundations of the world, God would choose Jesus to accomplish all that he had purposed. God would call him into the work. God would prepare him for it. God would equip him for it. He would give him exceeding great and precious promises as incentives and then hold his hand all along the way. And in the, in the days of his flesh, God proved his faithfulness unto his son, being with him. When Jesus would pass through the waters of sorrow and grief, being in this present evil world, God was with him. When Jesus would pass through the rivers of rejection 
and hatred from those who he came to save, they did not overflow him because God was with him. And when Jesus would walk through the fire of knowing that he would have to bear our sins in his body on the tree, he was not burned nor the flame kindled upon him, for God was with him. For the faithful God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. See, for those who think that God is merely a spectator in this great salvation, the light of the glorious gospel of God shows that this is quite the opposite. For God is my king of salvation, working salvation in the midst of the earth. He is a God that is doing wonders. Amen. And he's doing them by, through, and in his beloved son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and that work that God would do through him and in him and by him is of such marvel among men and among angels and those that men receive these things that God has purposed. They're re actually obtaining them and they're receiving them. They're believing them. They're walking in them. They're holding them. They're keeping them. And this working of God, she will come to a completion. But in the interim, as men and angels are seeing this and partaking of these, they're praising and glorifying God. They're, rec they're recognizing that this is God who is doing this. That he is a God who is a faithful God and a, and a God who is able to perform that which he has said. And he would accomplish this covenant that he made with his son concerning the people of God. To fill, this is a, in, in a, in a, unto a fulfilling of his eternal purpose. He said, speaking of his children, that they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. Saith the Lord. And God would do this marvel, this wonder, by putting away the sin of the world by Jesus Christ. He says, for I will forgive their iniquities and I will remember their sin no more. And so when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. See what God has purposed, he was, is unto our reception. Jesus came not only with the anointing of God, but also with the intimate and close knowledge of God that only he knows, and of God's promise and what it would take to fulfill that which God sent him for. Jesus said, all things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and the good news is, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. See, this is the work that Jesus is doing now. He's revealing the Father unto salvation, that men might receive these things and partake of them. Because God had purposed this. See, these things were occurring because God had purposed this even before the foundations of the world. And he chose Jesus to accomplish this. For he knew this about Jesus. He would not fail nor be discouraged. So for this to occur in men, for men to know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent unto eternal life, God would have to do a wonder, the likes of which which had never been done before. And it would begin with the putting away of sin from us as far as the east is from the west. The gospel of God announces with great power and glory that God did it. He did it by his beloved son, our Lord Jesus Christ. For he is the man approved of God by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him. Jesus was delivered up by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. God laid on him the iniquities of us all. And it was by the grace of God that Jesus tasted death for every man. Amen. And it was by that death that he did put away sin by the sacrifice of himself 
See, Jesus entered right into the purpose and will and working of God. For lo, I come to do thy will, O God, was his announcement of his faithfulness unto his Father. But as a wonder that God has done, this wonder, this wonder that is in through Christ Jesus our Lord, this ranks at the very apex or at the very top of God doing wonders. Because this work is not done yet. He is still working salvation in the midst of the earth. He has finished the work that God had given him to do in the earth, but now this work would continue from heaven by the exalted, ruling, and reigning, and glorified Christ. And he's doing a greater wonder, greater in glory, and majesty, and power. The putting away of sin was the glorious provision of God for the reception of men obtaining the salvation of God in Christ Jesus. But the putting off of sin wasn't the only thing necessary in the completion. There was by necessity a, a putting on a putting on of a, a new man. A new creation was required. One that would be received by God. That's what we're talking about, being received by God now. That creation had to be done in righteousness and true holiness. And this, again, God has done. God has accomplished this in Christ Jesus. For God made Jesus to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And with the divine provision of Jesus made for all those who are joined to the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection of God, are you in Christ Jesus? See, God put you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Amen. So then, as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. See, with Jesus' resurrection from the dead, his ascension into heaven, his being received of God, exalted and glorified, in that most holy place, God gave him a name which is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He set him far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Amen. That in all things, Jesus would have the preeminence. This is that working of salvation that God is doing in the word. It's concerning his son, Jesus Christ. Now I want to finish with this. The gospel of God announces that God is satisfied and pleased with Jesus. Amen. He is well pleased with Jesus. Well pleased in all things concerning him. Of who he is, what he has accomplished, and what he continues to do. Amen. And because of Jesus, God has announced himself being blessed by him. God has been. He is and always shall be blessed by his Son. God is blessed in Jesus' everlasting love for him. God is blessed in Jesus' fellowship with him, even before the beginning. God is blessed by Jesus' faithfulness unto him in all things. God is blessed by Jesus in his devotion to do him, to do his will, and to accomplish all his good pleasure. God is blessed by Jesus trusting in him and believing in him. Amen. God is blessed by his obedience to him. Yeah. Even the obedience unto death, even the death of the cross. Yeah. See, the, glory, the gospel of the blessed God announces God's satisfaction in being well pleased and being blessed because of Jesus. Amen. Because of Jesus, he is blessed and continues to be so. And I want to encourage you in this, that all that are joined to Jesus and continue to believe and trust in him, who are obedient unto him, God is well pleased with you as well. And you are able to bless God in your reception of these things of God, 
and you're believing God, and you're trusting God, and you're looking unto him for his salvation. God is blessed in that. God wants all his children to know this, even from the least of them to the greatest of them. Amen.